Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're continuing our lecture and we made it to objective two, which is on skeletal systems. Now, there are two types of skeletons, exoskeletons and endoskeletons. Exoskeletons encase whole organisms, whereas endoskeletons are internal. And in this first part of objective two, we really want to talk about skeletal structure. The components of our skeletal system, they're divided into axial and appendicular skeletons. The axial skeleton, it consists of the skull, the vertebral column, the rib cage, and it provides the basic central framework for the body. The appendicular uh, skeleton, it consists of the bones of the limbs, the pectoral girdle, and the pelvis. Now, both skeleton types are covered by other structures muscle, connective tissue, etc. And the structure of the skeleton is actually shown right here with many of the bones labeled. And one of the more important things that we want to cover is talking about bone composition. Bone is a connective tissue that's derived from embryonic mesoderm. It is much harder than cartilage, but it is relatively lightweight. And bone's characteristic strength, it comes specifically from compact bone. And it lives up to its name. It's both dense and strong. The other types of bone structure is spongy or, ca or cancellous bone. The lattice structure of spongy bone is visible under microscopes, and it consists of um, bony spicules, points, that are known as trabeculi. Now, the cavities between the trabeculi are filled with bone marrow, which may be either red or yellow. Red is filled with stem cells, which are responsible for generation of all the cells in our body. And yellow marrow is composed primarily of fat. It's relatively inactive. Now, the appendicular skeleton, it consistly, consists mostly of long bone. These bones have a distinct structure. All right, They possess a cylindrical middle segment that's called diaphyses, which expands at its ends into the metaphyses, culminating into the epiphyses. The exterior layer of these bones is made of compact bone, while the inner portion is spongy bone. And bone marrow fills the diaphyses and the metaphyses of these long bones. Now, the spongy nature of the epiphyses is crucial as it helps in distributing force and pressure efficiently at the joints. Now, I have these parts written down here. All right, with a, with, with a picture of a bone. Now, an essential feature of long bones, especially in younger individuals, is the epiphyseal or growth plate located at the inner edge of the epiphyses. This plate is, um, this plate is the site where the bone grows in length. And during one's growing years, the epiphyseal plate is packed with cells that divide, aiding in growth. However, of course, as one approaches adulthood, particularly during puberty, this growth plate, it seals up and vertical bone growth ceases. Now, encasing the long bone is the perosteum, a fibrous protective layer that acts as an anchor for muscle. Now, some cells, some cells within the perosteum can transform into bone producing cells. All right. And a well-functioning one is vital for both bone growth and its repair processes. Now, structures in the uh, musculoskeletal system are held together with dense connective tissue. Tendons attach muscle to bone and ligaments hold bone together at joints. All right. So, so far, we talked a little bit about that skeletal structure and we've talked now about bone composition. The next thing we want to focus on is the microscopic bone structure. Now, compact bone owes its strength to the bone matrix, which has a blend of both organic and inorganic substances. The organic compound of the matrix, of the matrix consists of collagen, glycoproteins, and various peptides, while the inorganic parts comprise of calcium, phosphate, and hydroxide ions. Now, when these inorganic ions come together, they form hard hydroxyapatite crystals. Additionally, bones are storage sites for minerals like sodium, magnesium, and potassium. 
for bones to be sturdy, it's really essential that both the organic and inorganic materials are distributed uniformly. This is achieved through a unique structure in the bone called osteons or the haversion systems. So picture them like concentric rings that surround a central tiny channel and these channels come in two orientations. Haversion canals run canals run lengthwise, so parallel to the bone, while Volkmann canals run crosswise, so perpendicular to the bone. These canals are vital as they house blood vessels, nerve fibers, and lymph vessels, which are very which which plays a very crucial role in the bone's health. Now, nested between these concentric rings are small cavities. All right, and these cavities they shelter an osteocyte, which is a mature bone cell. And connecting these are even tinier channels known as cannuliculi. These create a network that enables nutrient and waste exchange between osteocytes and the main canals. All right. Now, in addition to the microscopic bone structure, which also, again, we can see right here. We're also going to talk about, about bone remodeling. So two cell types are largely responsible for building and maintaining strong bones. These are osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts build bone, whereas osteo, uh, osteoclasts um, are, these are polynucleated resident macrophages of bone. They resorb it. So these processes, they come together. Um, th these processes together contribute to the constant turnover of bone. Now, during bone formation, essential ingredients like calcium and phosphate are obtained from the blood. And during bone resorption, these ions, they're released back into the, blood, into the bloodstream. Bone remodeling, it occurs in response to stress. And bone actually remodels in such a way as to accommodate the, repeated, the repetitive stresses faced by the body. Now, endocrine hormones may also affect bone metabolism. So things like parathyroid hormone, it can increase resorption of bone, increasing calcium and phosphate concentrations in the blood. Vitamin D also increases resorption of bone, leading to increased turnover and, sub and, and, and subsequently the production of stronger bone. And then calcitonin increases bone formation, decreasing calcium concentration in the blood. Now, with that, we also want to talk about cartilage and joints and movement. So these are the last two topics of our chapter. First, let's focus on cartilage. It is a softer, more it's softer and more flexible than bone. It consists of firm but an elastic matrix that's called the chondrin. This is secreted by sites called uh, by, by cells called chond uh, chondrocytes. Fetal skeletons are mostly made up of cartilage and this is advantageous because fetuses have to grow and develop in a confined environment and then they have to traverse the birth canal adults they have cartilage only in body parts that need a little flexibility or cushioning so think external ear nose um walls of the larynx and trachea and, and joints now, cartilage also differs from bone in that it is relatively avascular without blood and lymphatic vessels and is not innervated. Most of the bones of the body, they're created by hardening of cartilage into bone. This, is, this process is known as endochondrial ossification. It's responsible for the formation of most of the long bones of the body. Now, Bones may also be formed through intramembranous ossification in which undifferentiated embryonic connective tissue is transformed into and replaced by bone. All right, this occurs in the bones of the skull. Now with that, we can talk about joints and movement. Joints are specialized connective tissue that come in two main types, immovable and movable. Immovable joints are where bones are solidly linked, typically by fibrous tissue, forming sutures, and these are mainly seen in the skull where they hold the skull bones tightly in place. Movable joints, they allow for bone movement relative to one another. So examples include hinge joints like knees and elbows and ball and socket joints like the hips and shoulders. These joints, they're, they're reinforced by ligaments, which are strong bands of tissue that connect bones together. They have a protective covering called the synovial capsule, which encloses the articular cavity or joint space. Now, inside this space, a soft tissue layer 
named the synovian, produces synovial fluid, ensuring smooth and lubricated movement within the joint. Now, to further cushion the joint, there is an articular cartilage that lines the ends of the bones, preventing bone-on-bone -bone cartilage. <clears throat> now, regarding muscles, they typically attach to two bones, and when they contract, they induce movement in one of those bones. These muscles, larger attachment point is its origin. So the smaller attachment, usually further away, <coughs> excuse me, um, the smaller attachment, usually further away, is its insertion. And muscles frequently work in pairs. So for example, the biceps and triceps in the arm they have opposing actions. When the bicep contracts, the triceps relax and the elbow bends. And when the tricep contracts and the bicep relaxes, the elbow straightens. And this is called an antagoni uh, antagonistic pair. Now, some muscles, they have synergistic roles, meaning they work in tandem for a shared function. And those muscles are named based on their action. So flexors, like biceps, they decrease the angle across a joint. Extensors, like triceps, increase that angle. Abductors, like the deltoid, they move a body part outward from the center. And adductors, like the pectoralis major, draws it inwards. So with that, we've covered everything we need to know for this chapter. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.